All right, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what said the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his fate is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, Paul gives two Old Testament examples of being saved by grace and not by works. The two examples he gives are Abraham and David. Abraham was not under the law because the law was not yet given. David, on the other hand, lived under the law but was not saved by it. In fact, he broke it. He committed adultery, and according to the law, he was supposed to be stoned to death. But God spared his life. Why? It was because of his grace. Ooh, glory to God. Verses 9 through 12. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. <laughs> and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, we had been yet uncircumcised. Now, Paul's argument now returns to Abraham to illustrate that justification is universal. Justification is universal. Paul showed that the blessedness didn't fall only on the circumcised one, David, who was under the law, but it fell as well on Abraham, who was uncircumcised and not under the law. All right, let's look at uh, verses 13 through 17. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which, of, which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God made an awesome promise to Abraham. He promised him that he would become a great nation and that in him all families of the earth would be blessed. That promise came to Abraham because of the faith he showed toward God and not by the works of the law. It was God's generous grace to Abraham's absolute faith. The promise hinged on two things, the free grace of God and the faith of Abraham. Then he says that Abraham is the father of us all, both Jews and Gentiles who believes in Jesus Christ. Now note the words, I have made thee a father of many nations. Many nations indicate other nations besides Israel. It shows that he is the father of both the Jews and Gentiles who believes in Jesus Christ. Then he says that Abraham believed in God who quickeneth the dead or who calls the dead to life and who calls into being even the things which do not exist. What an awesome, powerful, but yet gracious God we serve. Woo, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. My God, I feel that. 
Look at verses 18 through 25. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for, for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, Abraham was a man of faith. He was a man of faith. He simply took God at his word. He refused to look at his circumstances. He kept his eyes on the promise. He believed the promise in spite of the fact that the circumstances nullified it. His unmovable faith in what God had promised him please God. Abraham believed that he was going to have a child from several, from Sarah's womb in spite of it being humanly impossible. Sarah was 90 years old. It is humanly impossible for a 90-year-old woman to have a baby. Her womb was dead. God declared Abraham righteous for his faith in the promise of God to raise up a son out of the tomb of death. That is, the womb of Sarah. In comparison, God declares everyone righteous who believe that he raised up his son Jesus Christ from the tomb of death. Everyone who believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus are declared righteous by God the Father. 